No, it's in my backpack. Where's Gary I? What if I look too damn juvenile in shorts? I want to be taken serious. Why don't we put the house lights up? Can we do that? Would you like to be me right now? No. Modi, how far back can I go? What about going back? Going backwards? How much can I go back? Let's go all the way over here, guys. Um, down the hall, to the right, and up the stairs. All the people are in the house, now it's time to go kick it. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, let's do this. Roll the camera. If I'm supposed to have my jitters before I go on stage, now's the time to have them. But the faster you walk, the less time you have to jitter. I can feel them from here. I can smell them. I feel it one with them. This is the height of art. Okay. Boy, I'm glad you all made it. It's one of the first gigs I've ever done in this town where everyone got to sit down. <laughs> Except those who were working and got paid to stand up. Usually you do these gigs and everyone that wants to be into it, they're trying so hard. And you, and you watch them and they're like standing like this, like... like <laughs> trying to be into it, like... <laughs> but inside they're going, God, I wish you just finished so I can go home and said and say, I saw it. Because <laughs> you've been up since who knows what time you got up in the morning and what do you do for a living? It's usually standing around listening to some asshole tell you what to do. And then you go to a gig and you get to stand around more. And then these people just <laughs> talk and talk and talk and talk. And then the last guy goes on and he always goes real long. And then by the time it's finished, you hate the guy. He goes, oh, I had this one last thing I wanted to do. Get the fuck out of here so I can leave! <laughs> yeah, but, you, but you still you kind of like him? That's what happened when I saw the Ramones in 1979, and, like, some guy's dick was, like, in my ass. I'm like... <laughs> and I had my entire face and, like, you know, some punk guy's hair, and so I had, like, dippity do in my face. And the Ramones were up there just, like, kicking ass, and they did, like, three encores of, like, nine songs each. <laughs> And I had sweated out all of my bodily fluid like an hour ago. I was nothing but like a potato chip in like poker clothing. And I was so dehydrated, I was just thinking to myself, please stop. <laughs> this song's going, I don't want to, oh God, not again. He's not singing again. But anyway, you all are sitting and I'm glad. Um, anyway, I was home just in time to watch the great TV show that engulfed Los Angeles for three days. No matter what channel you turned on, it was the shit is on fire show. Every channel, like channel seven. Another anonymous strip mall is on fire. And it's like nighttime, you see like men with garden hoses. Well, get it, you don't know. Huge Niagara Falls hoses dumping into massive, you know, volcanic expanses of flame. Didn't stop it. And you couldn't watch any other show except the shit is burning show. And it was depressing because then they cart out that fucking pig Daryl Gates and he's, well, I don't really have, I have no control whatsoever of this. And he said that and made it almost sound cool. The situation, he made it sound like he was right about something, you know? It was, it, was, it was so disgusting to sit at home and get insulted like that. So anyway, uh, one of the days I was over at a friend's house, she turns on the TV. Oh, look, surprise, the shit is burning show is on. And there it is, there's another big flame out. I'm like, oh, look, man, what a surprise, something's burning. And then they flash the intersection, and we both go like, ah! It was like three blocks away. And we look out the window, and like there's like dark clouds in the sky, and like ash is coming in through the screen. It's like Vesuvius, we're in Pompeii, and we're going to be covered in silt. National Geographic will dig us up, you know, 500 years later, we'll be just like, you know, totally preserved. The fillings will be intact, everything. And so, we hear the police helicopters. They're, so, they're coming so close, the whole building's going like And it's like chaos. So what happens when shit is burning, 
police are in the sky, the National Guard is in the 213 area code, there's guys in cars driving around looking for stuff to fuck up. What should you do? Probably lock your door and cool it. What did we do? Let's go check it out! So we ran down to the corner. Look, there it is! Cool! So, here's the scenario. We're looking down the road, and sure enough, fire engines, flame smoke, you know, helicopters, the sun is setting. It's kind of beautiful in a way. And on the other hand, it was horrible, you know? So we're standing there, all the, all the people in the neighborhood are kind of gathered on the corner, just checking it out. And across the street is a Sam Goody's record store. All glass, you know, big corner store, glass everywhere, with the big posters of all the bands behind there. There are two, one of those, you know, those rent-a-cop guys. There's two rent-a-cop guys, tan uniform, no gun, you know. <laughs> Those guys are always a little overweight, and they always have that kind of look of slight unease on their face. So it was like, you know, because this time it was a little out of hand. They weren't guarding a parking lot this time. You know, all right, you cement, don't move. You know, and then they work. They do that for eight hours. Oh, all the cars are still here. Okay, you can go home now. Oh, thanks. Here, oh, here's the stick back, but th this time there was looters coming up the street. There was like five guys standing across the street looking at the record store. Now, if you're a looter, imagine a store full of CDs and stereo uh, accessories and all this glass. I mean, if you're a looter, lots of glass is the bee's knees if you're a looter. Now, if you got a rock and there's no law, you want to put the rock through the window if you're a looter. And so they're looking at the glass like, you know, they're salivating. The two rent-a-cops are trying to maintain what the Los Angeles Police Department calls command presence. Command presence is when they pull you over for an illegal left turn and act like it's the invasion of Poland. <laughs> pull your car to the side, get out, you know, like, oh, okay. Get out of the car, you have 30 seconds to comply. Okay, I mean, it's broad daylight, it's 1992. It's just a left turn. Excuse me, officer, do not speak, okay. That's command presence, they're in control of the entire situation. Everything in the world is in their grasp. You will do nothing, you will say nothing, you will hand over your ID and registration and insurance, or you will go to the pokey. That's command presence, and when one of these pigs Pigs you, you are in the grip of command presence, and they really know how to do it. They, you know, they're, they're like, you know, steroid amped, and they're scary. You know, you can't, they won't even, you're not, they're not even reasonable. They're about as reasonable as my dad. So, these two rent-a-cop guys are standing in front of Sam Goody, really trying to look heavy to a bunch of guys who fuck shit up for a living. And they're, they're like... It's not working too well. So the two Renacop guys come over to us bystanders and they say, hey, we will deputize all of you if you will come across and stand in front of the Sam Goodies. This is your neighborhood. You must protect it. Okay. It sounded pretty good. Me being a little bit more cynical than the average person, in fact, I'm more cynical than the average, average stadium full of people, I said, man, this guy has about as much legal clout as anybody here. He can't deputize shit, man. So let's think about that. Come and protect your community. Come across the street and stand in front of Sam Goodies. Okay. So what you're saying is, you want me to take a rock in the face for Paula Abdul. Okay. I'm a little confused, so let me get this right. I'm supposed to take a two by four across my chest for Bono. I'm supposed to stand in front of a huge piece of plate glass and try and defend it from five gnarly youths who want to go right over my head 
for Morrissey. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you! Uh-uh, none of us moved. So, they go back to their post, hating it. Across the street, some young man picks up a wire rim trash can and he starts going in circles with it, like picking up speed. And he starts moving towards, like a top, starts moving towards the liquor store window. And he's gonna try and put that trash can right through. Right at that time, a few guys behind me with sticks go running after this guy. And they weren't running like, they were running as fast as they could. Do you think they're gonna run over to that guy and be like, stop that, what's the matter with you? Are you an animal? Go home! They're gonna try and like, put this guy's brains through his ears. And so I see the guy about to break the window and I say to myself, man, fuck you. The guy who owns that liquor store is cool. He doesn't need his windows broken. Cause if he's lucky, his place is just gonna get looted. That's if he's lucky. He'll be able to replace all the liquor, sure. He'll get a new window, fine. But what if those guys torch the place? You gotta realize that some of these people who own stores, you know, they work for a living. They have families. They have kids they're trying to put through college. Some of these store owners, goodness gracious, they might even be good folks who don't deserve this shit. It's just because a couple of cops can't control themselves and should jump into the La Brea tar pits. <laughs> so these guys go taking off after this guy. And I think to myself, fuck you guys too. Because they're like running after them as fast as they can. People behind me are like, get him, get him, don't, he's getting away, kill that motherfucker. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing, and all of a sudden I realize I'm standing next to guys who are just as fucked up as the guy with the trash can and the guys with the sticks. And I, <laughs> I had a crisis, it was, fuck all y'all. <laughs> I look up on the roof of the building right above my head. There's a man with a rifle. Man, I was out of there. Back to the apartment. I did not surface for two days. The day I surfaced was the day I got to go to Los Angeles International Airport and go to the Midwest and go speak at universities. So, the cab driver comes and he goes, how do you want to go to LAX? I said, take me down La Cienega. We'll take the surface street all the way down. So I figured, it's a surface street, it goes right through some hairy parts of LA, and I'll get to see some carnage, and I'll see what's happened, you know? Because it's not as if you can really go walking around. Excuse me, are you going to loot that? Can I watch? I mean, there, there's a, in Hollywood, there's a silo appliance store. Apparently it got cleaned out to the point where there was only a washing machine left. Can you imagine people pulling up with pickup trucks? One guy gets out has a bad back, four gang members help him get that washing machine on the back. Hey, hold up, man, you're gonna hurt your back. Oh, come on, fellas, let's get it up here. No, no, you stand back, man, just, just relax. You're gonna hurt yourself, you got that truss on. Come on, we'll do it for you. Here, take these extra speakers we ripped off, too. Have a nice drive home, you got it? Do you have enough t uh, gas in your tank? Look, here's a five. Fill it up with gas, you got a long drive back to Chino. Okay, have a good trip, buddy. So, I'm going down La Cienega. And as we go deeper, deeper south, it gets worse and worse. You start seeing broken windows, and then broken windows, and then burned stores, and burned cars, and then just, like, devastation. And uh, you see these poor store owners doing whatever they can to keep their places from getting destroyed. Uh, the obvious ones, black owned, black owned, black owned, which doesn't work so hot if some guy hates black guys. He just goes, ah, new target, Molotov, you know. It, it was, but you, these guys are just doing whatever they can to keep their store, you know. And the thing I thought was the best was there's a computer store. Computer stores are run by people who are pretty smart. The computer store has a single piece of plywood over the door. It says, already looted and burned, tenants upstairs. Okay? The place was not looted, it was not burned, there was a roof with nothing on top of it. There were no tenants on top. I can see these computer guys in the back into a virtual reality trip. Or just being like the cynical geniuses they are, like, oh, it's gonna be a riot. Okay, 
Oh, I got it, I got it. Do we still have that piece of plywood in back? Okay, just put on there. Tell them it's already looted. It's already burned. And just put it out there. No, 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 wait a minute. Tell them there's tenants upstairs. Yeah, that's great, but there's no tenants up there. Sure there is, man. Just think it and be it, right? All right, let's get the fuck out of here. And they would leave. And you see the looters come up. All right, Apple Supplies. They're going to go in there and get themselves a, a two-page color monitor, a quadra, a laser printer, all the goodies, all the software you can stick up your ass and haul home. Man, if you were like a computer guy, that would be the, that would be the shit loot a computer store you'd go in with, a, with all, the, all the gear you'd need. So you see these looters come up burning bottles of petrol and... You know, sticks are ready to loot and pillage and destroy. They come like, yeah! <laughs> already, they already, no, they already looted and burned it. And besides, it's not just people who live up there. <laughs> Luckily for the computer guys, I can see the looters looking up. Oh, there's no residences. What? Well, I don't know. I see. See computers in the window. Luckily, there was a McDonald's on the corner. Yeah, let's go loot that! And they all went down and just incinerated the McDonald's. You know, the McDonald's, Ray Kroc is in his grave, like, ah! <laughs> Which is kind of funny. But as much as it's fun to talk about it, I think looting is fucked. <laughs> oh, you don't know, clap. You're putting up with me, huh? I really appreciate it. I want to tell you a story of young love. I used to work at this pet shop when I was young. Growing up, I was in Washington, D.C. And at the time, it was 95% black. And I listened to black music. I got chased by black guys. I got charged with the murder of Martin Luther King at age six. <laughs> Hundreds of years of slavery at age eight. You know, it was a it was a tough town. You know, it was like it was a it was a you know politically charged environment. You know, my mom worked for Hubert Humphrey in the late '60s for his three of his election campaigns. So me and my mom were driving her little hippie mobile VW downtown, and a mace canister bounced off the hood. And we are in it, man. And my mom was going to those marches, and it's like, like, fuck yeah! You know, she's a tense lady, man. Imagine, like, Mia Farrow on, like, cheap drugs. <laughs> like, Mia Farrow, she did, like, a four-foot line of cleanser. And I came after you and saw her. Damn, girl. So anyway, I grew up in this town that was, like, pretty intense. And uh, all I listened to was, like, Black Soul Radio. And, you know, every, you know if, if, if you could just hang... It, and without getting beat up, and without, you know, feeling like you know, such a white boy, you know? Because I wanted to be black so bad, because they were the coolest, man. And their music was cooler than, you know, Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, you know? You know, Stevie Wonder, yeah. You know, Earth, Wind and Fire, that shit was cool. Not, God, not ELO. <laughs> just like, damn, man. So anyway, I worked at this pet shop, and I'd be up in the fish department scooping out so many dead fish. Man, that place had more dead animals in it than live animals. i go in there on Saturday to, like, you know, to clean the shit and everything, and then just half the store's population would be dead and dried up. All the, like, all the rodents were like, <laughs> they dry up. They don't have much moisture. They don't really rot. They just kind of... Like, and it was dying the most horrific facial expression. <laughs> like, every mummy you see, like, they dig up some mummy, oh my god, look, it's a man with a bunch of bandages around him, it must be a mummy. They're always just like, they must put him down there when they're still alive. And, you know, the chips are like, hey, motherfuckers! You know, it's like, <laughs> Anyway, my boss, his name was Skip, and he had this daughter who went to Wilson High School, which is like the public high school with boys and girls in it. 
I went to the Naval Academy prep school out in the suburbs with nothing but boys and ties and military haircuts. I wanted all the girls. But I didn't know how to talk to him because I was like this skinny, fucked up looking guy who went to an all boys school and was jacked on ribbon all the time. Who played shit after school every day. Pathetic. So anyway, every day after school, Skip's daughter would come into the pet shop. Her name was Rhonda. And you didn't say it like Rhonda. Like, help me, Rhonda. Rhonda was, Rhonda! She was the biggest turn on of the first 14 years of my life. She walks like she was always complacent and lazy, cigarette, gorgeous. It's like, hey, Henry. Talk like a black girl. I was like, oh, God, you are so fine. She always had the most terrifying guys with her. Like, you know, got huge guy, arm around her. She'd come into that pet shop with this guy. I'm like, I don't know. I'm really thinking that I might be able to go get some. Like, I, yeah, if I comb my hair right, she might like me. She probably thought I was a nice guy for such a weird dude who played with fish shit all day. And she would come into that pet shop and slay me, man. She'd just, like, walk in with a cigarette and, like, skip like, Rhonda, I told you not to smoke. You know what I mean? Hey, Henry. I'm like, I don't want, I want it to hang so bad. Hey, Rhonda. What's up? She'd be like, and I'm there, like, you know, putting fish shit all over my school uniform. I get in there and show up in that cat hair and just I look like such a dick. And eventually skips all the shop and I never saw that lady again. But God, she was so fine. I'll never forget that woman as long as I live. Rhonda, every single time I hear that name, Rhonda, I was just going, oh man, it's not, man, you're saying it wrong. It's not Rhonda, it's Rhonda. Damn. In my pet shop, a lot of shit was always dying. Animals are dying left and right because I could only come in a little bit during the week. On the weekends, I would come in and like, you know, do the best I could. And I was like the only real staffer there besides my friend Ian. So on Saturdays, we would go in there and man, there'd be all these animals dead. And this is after Skip had bailed on the shop and sold it to this horrible man who didn't like animals. And so we had to invent all kinds of lies because we couldn't clean all the cages before all the customers came in. That's how we invented the Australian sleeping rat. <laughs> Woman comes in, there are like a, two dead rats in one of the rat cages, or, you know. And, you know, the other rats are like, hey, why don't you? And they're eating on them and stuff. I mean, hey, you know, that's big, big munch in the corner there. And this woman comes up to me and he and says, excuse me, gentlemen, um, I think two of the rats are dead. And I was trying to cook up some excuse like, well, I, and Ian just went, those are Australian sleeping rats. I'm like, he goes, they're very lethargic. And he like picks up this dead rat and just goes, see, it's alive. And the woman goes, oh, well. It, it, it looked dead to me. I, I know, a lot of people are fooled. They're not very good pets, but we have them anyway. <laughs> and with all the rats running around the cage, those are just normal rats. But these, these two kind of odiferous ones, they have a strange smell about them. They smell like rotting animal. Yeah, they're Australian sleeping rats. And like a little lady was like, oh, okay. And she went away. I was like, God, Ian, that was brilliant. You know? So. We had to like just fake people out all the time. And, you know, excuse me, sir. Those are uh, there's four uh, dead angelfish uh, in that tank over there. I think maybe you should clean them out. Oh no, no 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 no, those aren't dead. They're just they're just up at the top waiting to get fed. You know, they're just like because they want to be close to the food. They do that. They're very healthy and voracious fish. fish. You know. So one time around Easter, you'll get in 35 bunnies sell 35 bunnies, by Monday, 20 bunnies come back. Because they are all dying. And why are they dying? Because the people who buy the rabbits don't listen when the young guy at the pet shop says, please feed them these Purina rabbit chow pellets. Do not feed them carrots. Do not feed them lettuce. 
This is not Bugs Bunny. Rabbits, domestic rabbits, cannot eat carrots because they can't digest them. So the poor bastards eat the carrots, swallow them, they don't digest, and they shit like big chunks of cement and it rips them up from inside. It's like passing shrapnel out of your ass. You would look like Nancy Reagan after that. The most horrible thing in the world is a woman who's never had an orgasm, which is at least about 20% of you. And if you don't get a chance to come, girls, you're going to end up looking like that woman. And that's a mean thing to say, and sometimes the truth hurts. And sometimes it feels real good. So anyway, one of the rabbits came back, and it was all messed up. It had the carrots coming through it. And this crazy woman had bought the rabbit. This woman was nuts. And she bought the rabbit, she returned it. And she goes, she comes in and she had named the rabbit Bun Bun the Rabbit. But this woman talked like this. Here's Bun Bun. <laughs> oh shit. This is Bun Bun the Rabbit. We can no longer keep Bun Bun. Bun Bun is sick. And Bun Bun was actually pr hanging in pretty well. When rabbits are ailing, they'll sit in the corner of their cage and go... <laughs> They're really pumped. I mean, you can really see the pain on their faces, because they, they will pant, like... Oh, fuck, being a rodent, it's got a metabolism, it's really... <laughs> and I, believe me, I know what it's like. So anyway... They bring in Bun Bun, and me and here are trying not to laugh in this lady's face. Like, she looks away more like... So she's got the cage with bun bun, and like the, the, the cedar shavings are falling all over the place, and she's got these two kids who are like holding onto her leg and going, do we really have to give away bun bun? Honey, we can't keep bun bun. Please take bun bun back. I said, well, you know, the boss says there's no refunds. I can't give you any money. I don't want any money. I just want you to take good care of bun bun. We love bun bun. And the kid's like, we love bun bun. I'm like, okay. Well, okay, we'll take Bun Bun and see you later. And the, the two kids and the crazy woman leave. And so, uh, we're looking at, we're contemplating Bun Bun. We're looking at Bun Bun, and I said, Ian? He said, yes. I said, upstairs, you know what's in the big python tank. He says, there's a big python. I said, yeah, I think the big python is hungry. And he goes, let's feed Bun Bun to the python. <laughs> All right! Because, hey, pythons have to eat too. So, I took Bun Bun, and this is going to sound a little hairy to you, I took Bun Bun out of the cage, put a ruler behind Bun Bun's neck, put Bun Bun's chin and head on the countertop, very hard. Bun Bun didn't know what the fuck was going on, I was like trying to get out. I grabbed Bun Bun behind the shoulders and went out and up and popped that neck. It's called a cervical snap, and I killed Bun Bun's little rodent ass. Now, there's some people in the crowd who bought that record, you know, tame yourself. What are you doing that for? Tame yourself. Me and Ted Nugent will someday make a record called Mane Yourself. And they'll be chasing women, shooting guns, and eating hamburgers. Okay? So anyway, here's the reason why I offed Bun Bun. What would be better if you were Bun Bun? If I just kill your ass that fast, or if I take you up, live and kicking, and throw you into a cage with a huge snake that's going to chase your scared ass around the cage for a good five minutes, bite you with teeth to your size ratio that are going to be about this big, grab you, squeeze you till shit comes out of you and your eyes bulge, and squeeze you till you die. That would take a good five minutes. Would you rather that happen or me just turn your lights up? So, I killed Bun Bun, and I'm about to take Bun Bun upstairs to feed him to Mr. Python. The door of the pet shop opens. It's the crazy lady and the two kids. Bun Bun goes behind my back. We change our minds. We want Bun Bun. What do you say? Ah. You know, you're not a rabbit person. You, <laughs> you are a goldfish person. Ian, she's a goldfish person. Ma'am, we will give you a bowl, three goldfish, free water, everything you need to have a goldfish. Rabbit person, you are not. 
you are into aquarium fish, and we're going to start you right away on it. Ian, why don't you take it upstairs and show her a wide array of feeder goldfish. I want bung bung. Where's bung bung? She was not going to leave. So, this is where a nine to five horribly paying job turns into art. I hold out bun bun. Bun bun is really dead. Oh my god, bun bun! Bun bun! And I couldn't do that. It's an Australian sleeping Belgian rabbit. Would not work, because bun bun's neck is really broken and there's some blood coming out of its nose and you know, well it's dead. So anyway, it's really dead. And I'm like, um, here's Bun Bun. You want to just put him in the cage and you can just take him out of here? This woman was horrified. She hated my guts. And I just explained to her, well, you know, you bailed. And I figured the python could... She called me all these names and she left. And I never saw her again. I know, I'm a dick. Okay, look, here's something else, which I just remembered. We had these big fish tanks with goldfish that we would get for nickel each. And a lot of big fish eat goldfish, like Oscars and Jack Dempsey's and piranhas. You put in three goldfish in like the, the front of hand, and kills it and eats it up. And so anyway, we had big tanks of goldfish, because on Saturday, people would come in for like 50 at a time, you know, you give them a big water bag full of goldfish. So anyway, goldfish were great for kids, because they would come in and like for 25 cents, they got to have a fish. You know, they go, wow, I got a fish in a bag, you know, they put it in a, you know, big, you know, mixing bowl, and they have a fish, and the goldfish are amazingly hardy. They will survive an eight-year-old, somehow. And a mom won't, but the fish will hang right in there. So anyway, the kid comes into the pet shop, I want a goldfish, and he and I take this young man right up to the goldfish department. And it's this huge tank with like 90 million goldfish in it, and there's this one white one. It's like swimming through the I want that white one! I don't, I don't see it. And you see it? No, I don't see it. I, I just see a bunch of orange fish. Can you give me an orange fish? No, I want, the, I want that white one. What? You mean the one over there with the, the, the gash in his head? No, no, the white one. See? No, I'm just like spinning the kid along. So five minutes until the kid's almost in tears. I want that one! Like, that white one right there? Yes! <laughs> and so Ian fills the cup half full of water, and I take the net. And I make this big display of trying to catch this fish up, which I can just easily and catch. You know, and so I go, the kids are on the edge of the seat and starts moving and get this fish. And I go, ah! And I get the fish and I put it in the cup. White goldfish swimming around in the cup. I go, is that the one you want, kid? And he goes, that's it. That's the goldfish I want. I go, Ian, that is probably the coolest goldfish I have ever seen. Ian goes, I hardly agree. That is a goldfish to be reckoned with, most certainly. And we went on and on about how bitchy this goldfish was. And then Ian said, Henry, it's time. I said, okay. And I took the goldfish out of the little cup and I said, is this really the one you want, kid? And the goldfish is like, you know, in the air. And I'm like, this is a great goldfish. He's like, put it back in the water. I'm like, okay. And ate it. Kid goes screaming, running out of his place like some of his little ass on fire. It was crazy. The mom called. I don't know what you had going on in this place when you should tell your two employees to grow up. Even at that young age, we knew we were bound for greatness. I went out with this girl for a while really into it. I'm not trying to get into one subject here. All they talked about was chicks. It was, it was so boring. <laughs> but anyway, I was like really into this one girl and it was really cool. We're skipping merrily down the lane and I was just like, man living in lukewarm water. <sighs> Henry, huh? Henry, you're about to walk off a roof. Okay. <gasps> I just didn't care about anything. I was in the she got me. And so I was like, ah! <laughs> Poor Hank. <laughs> Sucked, man. I was so depressed. Man, I was just like standing beside myself. I was so depressed. Looking at this guy sitting in his chair in his room, staring at the wood in the floor for three hours at a time. <laughs> Playing a Miles Davis CD over and over again. And you pull again, you know. <coughs> you know, just hate my just dying. 
When you do get left by the girl or the boy, say you're in my shoes, the, the girl leaves you, and then you are Mr. Depressed Guy. The weight of the world is crushing down upon you, and you're really depressed, you know? You are really depressed, and you're in your room like, oh, oh. And you know, everyone goes through it, the relationship. You know, and you're, you are at the bottom, like, oh, oh. You will go into your room, and you will do all of that really hilarious shit. That bitch! You know, and it's kind of good for you to, to vent a little. So, you know, if you're like me, you lock the door, you paint the walls black, you put on black clothing, dye your hair black, get some black paper and some black ink, turn the lights off, put on a, one of those shitty records from Manchester and, and, and just scribble manic poetry, page after page after page, it comes out of you like a volcanic fountain, and it's all good, and it's all profound, and it's all real, because you are the king or queen of pain. No one knows the pain that you know. You are alone, and everything you write is very intense and profound, no matter how silly it is. Oh, lonely moon. I look upon you, and I see myself looking back upon Earth. Oh, do not cry for me. I lay in the desert of alienation. I am alone. Pity me not. And you'll write all this shit and read it aloud to yourself and you'll think you are so bitchy. <laughs> then three weeks later you read it and you're like, oh yeah, there's that killer stuff I wrote. And then, like, it's really hard to read because it's black paper and black ink, so you have to kind of shine it in the light. And you're like, but pity me not, for I lay in the waste of exile and alienation unto myself, dot, dot, dot. Get the f <laughs> But... While you're in the grip of that alienation and depression, you are thinking very clearly. You, you, you do not miss a single workout. You go on some awesome diet that when you are sane, you can't possibly maintain. I will eat no sugar. I will work out every day. I will be the most efficient machine there is because no one will ever make me feel that low again. Ha! I got you all! You know, and you get really... I stand alone, and you really feel like you're, you know, you know. So, every once in a while that happens, and like three days in, you're starting to feel pretty good about it. So, I, I heard you're really depressed. Yeah. Oh, isn't that a drag? <laughs> no, I like it. Well, how about me and my friends, we take you out and we'll cheer you up. Hey man, get the fuck away from me, okay? You want to go right back into your room and like put on one of those silly records that you can't really play when, you know, you're in love or something. Okay, for you guys, and I've said this before, when you get dumped by the girl, do what I do. It's really silly. You have to lock your door so no one comes in on you. You, and you need to go out to the record store in preparation for this, because I'm sure none of you have any records that feature the vocalist Ronnie James Dio. <laughs> but I do. I've got them all. Because I play them when the chick has bailed. Because on every Ronnie James Dio record, there is one, two, three, Evil Woman, Look Out Tonight songs. And you'll always come off with a self-righteous thing like, No, look out, evil woman, I see thee. Ha! Out! Out, devil woman! Beware! Okay, which is, you know, kind of silly, like right now. Like if we, if we could cut to evil woman look out tonight over the PA, you all would be like, Okay, but when you're like alone in your room and you put on that Sabbath record he sings on, he has that song called Walk Away, which is just about like you see the woman and you just go, ah, walk away. <laughs> when the chick is bailed on you, you will sit in your room with a fake cape on that you've made out of a towel and a paper clip. And you will like, you know, take a pen and you will sing along with Ron. 
walk away. If anyone came into that room at that point and saw you with your cape and like the celery stick or whatever you're using, one foot up on a table like there would be no way you could say you were doing something else. You would be, you would be so incredibly busted, it wouldn't even be funny. All of you guys have been busted jerking off, haven't you? You are half the dick over the sink, and you're going for it. You, the, one, the one time you left the door unlocked, the door opens, you have a minor seizure as the door out to the... You, fast as you can, move over to the toilet to make it look like yours. Just take a miss. Sometimes you can pull it off and... Hey, I'm in here, man. Okay, right on. Yeah, we're yeah. Try to piss with an erection. Don't look at the you know. But every once in a while, you just get busted. Because the door will open and then you get fully caught leaping to the toilet. And the guy, the guy, he's been, you know, the guy opens the door, he's been caught too. Hey man, I, I didn't see anything, it's cool. I've been three times today too, it's cool. There's this idea in my head I have, and the idea is uh, called, part of you dies. When something happens, part of you dies, you know? My dad would take me out on the weekends, stand me up in his backyard at attention and make me sing the national anthem. If I messed up one word, he'd smack me in the side of the head. Every time he'd smack me, part of me died. He'd make me do the Pledge of Allegiance. He'd make me sing all these songs. My country is smack! Tis of thee, goddammit! Part of me died. When I would lie in my bed at night and listen to my mom, fuck next door to my room, part of me would die. When her boyfriends would beat the shit out of me, part of me would die. And part of me dies all the time. And so, I deal with that the best I can when parts of me die. And that's why I write, because when parts of me die, it hurts, and I write about it. Parts of you die all the time. Sometimes it's beautiful, most of the time it just hurts. And um, anyway, I wrote this last night, like three in the morning. Time with you was perfect, never boring, never wasted. You were always the same, intense and beautiful, amazing. I would look at you as we sat in places. You awed me with your sheer presence. When I was away from you, I would stare at your picture endlessly. Something you never got a chance to find out. Something you'll never know. One fact. I would have done anything for you, knowing that it all could have been used against me. I know what happens when you do that even a little. I have the scars. For you, I would have pulled sunlight from thin air and lifted the curses from your life. I loved you so. It's tragic at this point. It's like an ongoing funeral. You're out there somewhere, and sometimes I feel myself dying slow, knowing that you're alive somewhere, and someone else is smelling your hair and touching your neck. You know how those barbed and clawed nights can pass. They rip the meat right off your back, send you into a corner, and leave you with enough of your senses to realize that you'll live to see another hammering night alone. So that's where I was at 3.30 a.m. this morning. This is a story about two boys. One boy was born in California, conceived in the Midwest in 1961. One other boy was conceived in Washington, D.C. and born in a snowstorm in Washington, D.C. in 1961 at D.C. Columbia Hospital. 
Each boy grew up feeling totally alienated, totally weird, totally convinced that he came from a different planet. Each of them had one stroke of good fortune. They crossed paths. And it was just by sheer luck these two aliens crossed paths. They became incredible friends and had a friendship that was beyond words, that was beyond thought. They could finish each other's sentences. When they were together, they were so telepathic. It's like they were brothers. It's like they shared the same mind. When they were together, they used to call themselves the chosen one. Everything the other one said was awesome. People around them used to say, why don't you guys just get it over with and fuck each other, okay? <laughs> the two would laugh at them and know that these people had no idea how cool the other one was. They would argue with each other. You're awesome. No, you're awesome. No, you're awesome. No, you're awesome. But you're the man. No, you're the man. I guess I am the man. You are. No, but you are. On and into the night. They would watch really stupid movies for their comedic impact. Anything with Sylvester Stallone. The more serious the movie, the more the boys would laugh. They worked very hard in the living room, aping Sylvester Stallone's sagging face. They dissected the movie over the top as one dissects Moby Dick or Ulysses. They got down every nuance of Sly's tortured face. They believed they were the funniest, coolest, most awesome guys on the planet. Together, they were invincible walls of mirth. They did so much cool shit, you will never be able to finish a book about the two of them. The epic movie could never be made because Lawrence of Arabia was four hours and it, it, it was too long for theatrical release. This one would have to be about 50 hours and just no one would take it on. And you couldn't release a film called The Two Most Awesome Dudes Who Ever Was. <laughs> the two guys spent years together traveling through many countries, going through high times, low times, times of no money, no hope, no chicks, no friends, nothing but each other. A little while down the line, one comes into some money and says, hey man, you're living in that dump. I got this cool place over here and you're awesome and you can't be living in a dump. Why don't you live here? And the other one said, that's great. That way we'll always be together and we will be the chosen one. The mind will be in full effect at all times and earth will come to us. We will be awesome at all times. And each one knew the other one was right. So they shared a house and it was amazing. They went to the whiskey a go-go one night to watch a band. It did not matter what band it could have been. It did not matter who was with them. No one survived the treatment they gave people. It could have been Black Sabbath in 1972, their common favorite band, and they still would have bagged Don Ozzy because everything was funny when they were together. So the two of them are watching a band at the whiskey, laughing until they urinate their pants at how funny the band is, when actually the band is kicking much ass. They're making it into the worst gig on earth and having the greatest time. People are passing them, recognizing both of them and saying hello. The two say hello back, and once the person who said hello turns away, they make stabbing motions at that person's ass with air knives. <laughs> and laugh and high-five and bond even further. <laughs> the two boys were a walking riot at all times. Maybe not to anyone else, but each other. They left the whiskey, and they went all the way through West Hollywood towards Venice, with their middle fingers out the window, flipping off all of West Hollywood and Westwood. <laughs> 
very mature, but they thought they were the funniest fuckers on earth. And they were. They got back to the house in time to go to the video store to rent Rocky Five. And they even started getting ready for the movie two hours before they would watch it by looking at each other and go and saying, go for it. No, you go for it. No, you fuck me. No, I'll fuck. No, you fuck me. No, I'll go for it. No, you go for it. Hey, you gotta go for it, right? Yeah, I got pulled out of the womb, right? Yeah, with a monkey wrench. That's why half my face doesn't work. And that's why I over the top. You see me when I'm going, when I, when, you know, I take it and I take it over the top. You see my face and I go, yeah. A lot of people said I'm an idiot, right? But I'm very erudite. I mean, if Mel Gibson can do Hamlet, I can do Macbeth, right? Look, to be or not to be, see, I can do that, right? A lot of people don't know that I'm a very erudite and intense actor, man. But one day people will see my full potential. They think I'm a meathead. But what they don't understand is I'm worth $160 million, right? They might hate me, but I could buy them. The two boys laughed all the way back from the video store knowing that Rocky V was going to be the greatest movie ever made because those two would be watching it. And they decide that right before the film, they better go get some food so they can eat hearty as they watch this incredible film that's going to make them laugh until they piss their pants. They go to the store and they buy their food and they're walking down the street making fun of Sylvester Stallone like there's no tomorrow and they're 30 feet away from their shared home, and they're laughing and saying, hey, you go for it. No, I'll go for it. You, you gotta go for it. You don't go for it. Someone else will, right? And then you're just standing around. That's why I go for it all the way, right? And some of the films I make, right, are kind of stupid, like that one. Rhinestone, right? A lot of people say that guy's a moron, right? I mean, that movie's so gross, I can't even watch it, right? And right then, two guys came out of the bushes and put guns in their faces and said, this is a hold up. And the two guys went, uh, okay. And the boy who was born in Washington, D.C., was told to get on his knees, and he got on his knees, and he had a gun at the back of his head. He looked over at his buddy who was born in California, and he looked down, and the boy from California is lying face down on the sidewalk with a gun at the back of his head. And then a moment later, the two boys were ordered to get up and walk towards their own house because they were going to go inside. The boy from Washington, D.C. is the one who had the key and knew very clearly that once they were taken in, they were going to be marched into the back room, told to kneel down on the ground, and they would be shot execution style on the back of the head. So the boy from Washington, D.C. realized they had about 45 to 60 seconds to live and was vainly trying to figure out a way to turn this all around. The boy from Washington, D.C. opened up the door took five steps in, dropped the groceries, saw that the TV was on, furiously thought of an idea of maybe trying to give these two sons of bitches the VCR and the television, and maybe they would just go the fuck away when the boy from Washington, D.C. heard a slight scuffle. BANG! He ran out of the back of the house, ran up an alley, made a left, made a right, made a left, went to a phone call, dialed 911, and said, I live at 809 Brooks Avenue, in, Link, in Venice, California, and there was a shooting at my house. Can you please come here? So I walked into the middle of the street, not knowing what the fuck to do with myself. 30 seconds later, a plainclothes cop car comes racing up the street towards me, orders that I go to the side of the curb and put my hands on my head. They arrest me, throw me in the back of a car, drive me up to my own house, and keep me there for 20 minutes and make fag jokes outside the car and point at me and call me sweetie. I keep asking in vain, can you please tell me what happened to my friend Joe Cole? He might want to know how I'm doing. He might be scared. I need to talk to my friend Joe Cole. He's my roommate. He's my best friend. Where's Joe Cole? And the cop says, sweetheart, just calm down. We need some details on your partner. My partner? And the cop said, yeah, what's your partner's name? I said, my partner, my roommate. My other half is Joe Cole, he's 30 years old. 
and uh, can you please take me out of these cuffs? I haven't done anything wrong. Why have you arrested me? I need to talk to my friend. Do you need the key to my house? You might need to get in there. Some guys had guns and they put them to us and there's a shooting. Can you tell me what's going on? Finally, one cop sits down in the car and he's working on his piece of paper on his clipboard. I said, excuse me, sir, my hands are turning blue and also can you please tell me what happened to my friend Joe Cole? And the cop turns around with very studied nonchalance and he said, oh, he's dead and went back to his clipboard and wrote like it was no big deal. So they held me for about nine or ten hours at the police station and let me go in the morning. And my friend took me back to my house and we were preparing to clean up as much blood as comes out of a six foot four young man who gets shot in the left cheek. And uh, I was getting ready to mop up that living room and me and my friend were saying, we can do this, right? Yeah, we can do this. We're getting psyched up to mop up so much blood. And we get to the front porch and there's television reporters there, National Enquirer, and there's a big puddle of blood right on the dirt on the front porch and there's flies eating it. And I look down and this puddle of blood is very big and very deep and very viscous and there's a lot of flies eating my dead friend's blood and that was Joe Cole, man. And so I went by the reporters, I've never said no comment to a reporter in my life. I said fuck you a lot of times, but I've never said no comment. I felt like I was in Watergate or something. So I walked into the place and I had to go right into Joe Cole's room and get his phone book and call every single fucking number in that phone book from A to Z and tell them the most horrible news I could think of. Between phone calls, I would have to steady myself so I wouldn't start crying and convulsing. I would have to calm myself down so I could make the next phone call. So when I talked to that person, that person would hear a voice and not somebody on the other line going... <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for a while. And then it took us a couple of days of frantic moving and we moved every piece of furniture and gear out of that house and threw it in a storage space. And I lived in someone's office for a few weeks and went on tour. And I'll tell you what, man. All that talk about kill a motherfucker like it ain't no thing and all that tough gang banging shit, you know what? I think it's fucked up inside. Because when someone dies, it's not like in those movies like, like Lethal Weapon 3 where they just die and you know how, how Mel seems to kill people and never has to really answer for it and the bodies stack up and afterwards he just you know, paid $7.50 to see a lot of cars blow up, a lot of uh, silicone impregnated breasts and a lot of dead bodies. You know what happens when people get shot? They don't like struggle for air and say something witty and dramatic as they die. They just fall on the ground, shit their pants, and have their brains gone off the back of their fucking head, man. The last few months have been really hard. It's been really rough. But there's one upside to the whole thing. Because, like I said, I got enough horror to sink your ship, okay? And who needs to hear it? It just will bum you out, and it's just a self-indulgent blues jam. And I'm not going to pull you through it because I pulled you through it enough. There's one good thing that comes from this. When something this powerful happens, there's a powerful lesson you can get. And here's what. I'm not trying to say I'm some goody-goody, you know, oh, I love you all, and that, and that new wave shit. But look, I don't know many of you people. I don't even know how many of you are here tonight, but I'll tell you one thing. I like all of you, all right? And I don't like all of you. Like, I want to move into your house. I want you to come over and hang out with me and shit. I mean, but I like you. I really do. And I'm really glad you're here, not because you paid whatever to get in here, because you're alive. And I don't even know you, and I, I love your life, because you got one. And if Joe was here now, he'd be, he'd be here, but he's not. And I don't believe in an afterlife. You step on a bug, it dies. I shoot you in your face, and you die, and you don't come back. And that's my belief, okay? There's no ghosts. There's no afterlife. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a kind of a cash and carry guy. Wash and wear. So, with that belief in mind, I reckon that while you are here, since you're not going to Disneyland and all that shit and hang out with Jim Morrison and, and get the jam with Hendrix and Miles and all that cool shit, if I were you, I would really kick a lot of ass while you're here. Because when you die, when you're dead and you die, you're fucked because you don't get to go hang out and do cool shit anymore. So if you're thinking of going home and putting a fucking needle in your vein and shooting heroin, always know one thing. At least my opinion is, that's fucked, okay? Glorious thoughts of suicide, 
if you ever kill yourself, I would love to be able to bring you back to life just so I could kick your ass. I think there's just no time for drinking this Jack Daniels poison. There's no time for hanging yourself. There's no time for blowing your brains out. There's no time for heroin. As bad as life is, people like Daryl Gates, you know, uh, people training you to be a racist moron. There's a lot of bad shit out there. And as bad as life gets, life is fucking awesome, man. Because the alternative, going to a funeral, looking at a little plastic box that contains your friend, sucks. So all of you are the same on one level. All of you in here are just like me on, in one way. You're all breathing. And that's the coolest, man. And you have to go with that. Because there's nothing else to go with. That's the only break you get. You get to live tomorrow. You get to go on. You get to move forward. And it might not seem like much, but for me, it's right now, it's all I'm hanging on to. And it's all I've got going. And it's what I'm going to stick with. So, on that note, I just want you to know that I hope you had a great fucking time tonight. I want you to live two ways. Long and strong. Good night. P word is poetry, and I don't like to use that word. I think poetry is for poets. Uh, cappuccino drinking, beret wearing, fake ass mustache having, striped shirt, velvet underground adoring poets. Leaky, sniveling, moist, clammy handed guys who can't get any. I just go up and express myself freely. That's what we call a euphemism for talking shit. When you title yourself, you immediately lend yourself to all kinds of pretension, especially in the poetry business. I'm a poet. If someone said, I'm a poet, I immediately hate him. <laughs> I say, you're a dick. No, 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 come back. Already it's gone. I'm losing it. Okay. No, I, no, I have, no, excuse me, excuse me. I have lost it. I have lost it. <laughs> I, I was losing, he was the way out. Okay. Okay. I have it with me. I'm being PI right now. It's politically incorrect, not poison ivy. Here we go.